here we are. We're on Facebook. Welcome those of you who are joining us online. Um, I want to let y'all know we got two more lessons. This is one of the two, and then we're up to date. So after next week, well, I won't be teaching. Um, do we have plans? There'll still be a class here. Yes. Yeah, there'll still be a class here. So I encourage you to come back. But we're we'll probably continue uh, looking at the discussion questions in the Old Testament review. There you go. And and we were two or three lessons in, but we'll try to figure out some way to get us back on track and then uh, yeah. basically try to take up the more difficult topics and in a general review of the Old Testament. And I want to encourage you because I believe that those of you who spend a little time with this, you are scribes prepared for the kingdom. You have You've learned a little bit about this, and you don't have to be a scholar or a master of languages. You have to have some appreciation for how God has provided his word. And, I, the, and what I always want to emphasize is if you go back and you can look at the lesson online, there's that lesson about the work of the scribe. And it, was, it wasn't about the learning. It was about the fact that the old Hebrew scribes took that extreme care with God's word. And that's the part that continues even today is that, that, that incredible care of managing this word and reading it and, and living by it and knowing that it all matters. And uh, it's a sacred task, not just a cold, sterile, scientific task. So, um, just to review real quickly, we saw the origin of these texts, Old Testament, New Testament, the transmission of languages, and then we get over to English because to finish the story for us, we have to somehow go from all of this to English. And the road across the English translations and versions, it's a, uh, it's a long one, and it's an interesting one, and we'll complete it next week. But the big, the big centerpiece on that road is, of course, the King James Bible. And that's what you have here. This is the front of the King James Bible. Uh, this would be the inner, the frontispiece, uh, the cover inside. The Holy Bible containing the Old Testament and the New, uh, newly translated out of the original tongues and with the former translations diligently compared and verified by His Majesty's special commandment appointed to be read in churches imprinted at London by Robert Barker, printer to the King's uh, Most Excellent Majesty, Anno Domini 1611. So, um, back in 2011, Zondervan published a facsimile of what the King James Bibles would have been like. Now, they would have been larger than that. This, this is a smaller one, but it, it looks, this, it's, a, it's a reproduction of what those pages look like. And that's, uh, you can see that uh, page in here that would have been on the front. Um, the, um, what's most interesting, and it's, it can be difficult to read because of the typeface that they use. But it's kind of fun too, and uh, there is a there's there's two prefaces. One is to the Most High and Mighty Prince James, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, etc. And this is from the translators of the Bible, and they're dedicating it to King James, who has uh, commissioned the translation. And then there is a preface for the readers. And they've got to have good eyes. Um, but keep in mind, too, that this would not have come to them as, oh, here's a little Bible I can take home and I can go cozy up by the fire and I'll read this with a cup of coffee. This would be a great Bible that you would have in the public space and it would be read. Remember, it's appointed to be read in churches. And so uh, they even put an almanac in there. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, this is sort of
sort of a, uh, and here's the, the symbol of the king. And this is kind of, oh, and, and this is one I love, the, the genealogy. It's got the genealogical table of Adam and Eve. And, I mean, you think about all the work that they put into this, and uh, this goes on for pages. And um, it's kind of a Swiss Army knife of Bibles, you know, when they put this out there. They made it a, uh, uh, quite the object to have in your congregation, in your parish church. I'll pass this around. Y'all can take a look at it and just get a flavor for what this looks like. Um, and then you can imagine what it would have been like to be in 1611. But what I want to remind us, though, are a few things. Um, now, we call it King James Bible. If you're over across the pond in Britain, they tend to call it the authorized version. Sometimes you'll hear it called the authorized version over here. And you'll hear, some people say, well, now that's the authorized version. But who do we, what does that mean? Who authorized this authorized version? Are we, are we putting the imprint on it that God authorized this version? Or what are we saying? And nowhere in it does it actually say it's the authorized version. It just says appointed to be read in churches. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, remember that there's some important things that happened historically about the time that uh, this comes out. Maybe, well, I say about the time, it's within uh, 150 years. There's the Renaissance. You have this renewal of learning in the 1300s. Constantinople falls to the Turks. Believe it or not, that matters. Here's why. You remember that division between the West and the East? Okay, when Constantinople is taken over by the Turks, that means that the East declines in its prominence and its influence in the uh, in civilization in Europe and in that part of Eurasia. Okay, um, so their influence is lessened because of that. Gutenberg develops the printing press. Now we can print documents. We can print Bibles. We don't. We're not reliant on manuscripts. Protestant Reformation suddenly opens up the idea that we can translate this. In 1517, Luther kicks this off in Germany, and he says, why can't we read the Bible in, in, in German? And that idea transmits over to Britain, or England, which is the source of our language. And, uh, and we talked about John Wycliffe, who had done that hundreds of years earlier, in the 1300s, in the 14th century. But then he's followed by William Tyndall, who is really the English Luther. He, he translates scripture um, into English, working off of the original sources, just like Luther did with German. And then you have Henry VIII's Act of Supremacy, which means that Henry VIII decides to set himself up as the head of the church in England. Uh, Reformation takes a little different shape over in Europe. We're going to get historical tonight because there's, there's no way to avoid this. Otherwise, you can't really understand the significance of all of this. And you can't understand what we've inherited unless you have some sense of where we came from. The Reformation in England, not Scotland, but in England, will look different because it's very political. And it's very much driven by the throne. And William Tyndale translated the Greek and the Hebrew into... English, uh, you get your first modern English translation, but Tyndall's translation is not complete. He, he, he does the New Testament, but he doesn't get all of the Old Testament. And in fact, he has to go on the run. And part of the reason, it, it's not just because he's doing something he shouldn't. Now, now Wycliffe is, is, is very much out of line. They don't want him translating this. Tyndall's translation is bad enough, but Tyndall is also questioning Henry VIII and, and the and what he's doing is active supremacy. And when the king is up against you, that's not good. You become a bit of an outlaw. So he goes to Europe, and while he's in Europe, Henry VIII convinces the emperor, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles. He says, why don't you round up Tyndall for me? He does. Tyndall's actually executed, not back in England, but over in Belgium. And Tyndall's last prayer is, Lord, open the king of England eyes. He's strangled and then they burn him at the stake. Uh, and they consider that to be merciful. Uh, but there is the, and this is a printing from Fox's Book of Martyrs. 
by a Puritan named John Fox, who we'll get to in a moment. Because John Fox is, um, is going to be, a, um, he's almost going to be a contemporary of William Tyndall. But they're going through their own persecution, like Henry is persecuting Tyndall. And, uh, we'll, and so that's why the Book of Martyrs becomes so important, because it becomes examples and stories for them while they're struggling under the reign of Bloody Mary and Queen Mary. Um, here's your timeline of your English translations that I really worked this out for myself because I'm trying to understand the relationship of it all. So, because these dates, I mean, these dates are meaningless if you're, if you're an American. And 1534, what happened in America? I wasn't even in America then. <laughs> well, we didn't know. You know? Um, but um, you got conquistadors running around here. 1534. It's going to be the reign of Henry VIII. We'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. But Tyndall has completed that English translation. But it's an incomplete English translation. He actually doesn't get to finish it. So even though Tyndall is the first to translate the ancient texts into modern English, what, what would count as modern English for us, he doesn't finish it. The work is finished by Miles Coverdale. Now, Coverdale uh, publishes, prints, what's called the, the Coverdale Bible. Um, he's a Catholic friar, and along the way, he becomes a Protestant. A lot of these leaders are, in some sense, connected to the Catholic Church. They're going through the, the English Reformation. They join up with the, the English, the Church of England, and then within the Church of England, you have a Reformation deep within it where you have the Puritans, and some of them will track with the Puritans, and some of them will remain bishops and other church leaders in the Church of England. Tyndall's work is inherited by a fellow named Tom, well, he's not named Thomas Matthew, he's known as Thomas Matthew. His name is actually John Rogers. Thomas Matthew is a pen name. Why do you think he'd want to have a pen name? Protect himself from, yeah. from the king. Yeah, you got to protect yourself from King Henry VIII. Because, and the funny thing is, Henry will actually, the work that Thomas Matthew does, will combine with Coverdale. Coverdale will take Thomas Matthew's work, because it's good work, and he's building off of Tyndale, and Coverdale, in 1539, will come up with what's known as the Great Bible. Henry VIII approves it. It's Coverdale using Rogers and Tyndale's notes, because he, he, he's in communication, and Henry approves it. it. It's approved in the Church of England. And that's the irony of this. Here's Henry, who has this beef with Tyndale, and then later on he's using his Bible. So tell me that Tyndale's prayer, God opened the eyes of the King of England, and Maybe he didn't quite open his eyes, but still, the, the word is being shared in English. Now, meanwhile, you've got this um, Protestant movement that's growing. Look, we've gone from 1534 to 1557, so you're talking about 23, 24, 25 years there. This Protestant movement in England is taking off, and a lot of the hardcore Protestants, the ones who are following what's going on on the continent over in Germany with Calvin and Luther and Zwingli, they relocate to Geneva, Switzerland, which is an independent state of sorts. And they start, you know, to me, this is the feeling I always get, and this is not necessarily a fair comparison, but um, we can relate to this. It's like the days of the Cold War, when you'd have the radio free stations broadcasting into the communist uh, Soviet Union. You know, it's like, here's the truth, here's the truth. And it, that, that's what these Geneva guys were doing. They're churning out this Bible that, hey, this is going to be the Bible in English, and it's going to be vibrant, and it's going to be lively. And that's, the Geneva Bible is extremely popular, and it remains popular for a number of years. That's the Bible that William Shakespeare used. That's the Bible that uh, John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, used. Uh, this Bible was picked. Later on in the English Civil War, the leader of the Puritan faction, Oliver Cromwell, he and his men carry that, that Geneva Bible. That's the one that they prefer in life. It is the Protestant's Bible of choice. 
In fact, it even shows up on the Mayflower. They take it over to America. They love this Geneva Bible because this is seen as kind of a, a pure people's grassroots Bible. It's not tainted by all those hierarchies. And the, the, uh, the front image on the Geneva Bible has an image of the Exodus and the pillar of fire. Benjamin Franklin picks that up and, and decides he's inspired by that to come up with one of the early versions of the Great Seal of the United States. So this independent, free spirit that's coming through this Geneva Bible in those early days, really for another maybe 200 years, is popular, but not with everybody. The royal houses of England do not care for it <laughs> because it doesn't necessarily exalt the monarch. But we'll get to that in a second. Uh, meanwhile, they've got their response to that. They had the Great Bible. That's the official one. So in Church of England, you read the Great Bible. But those folks out on the street, they're loving their Geneva Bibles. And so we improve it with Elizabeth, and you get the Bishop's Bible. Now, bishops are the, the, the leaders within the Church of England. Uh, whereas in a lot of the Protestant churches and in the Church of Scotland, in the Reformed churches, it tends to be elders, Presbyterians. That's it means leadership by presbyters or elders. Um, may not seem like much of a difference to us, but trust me, for them in the 16th century, it's a huge difference. The Bishop's Bible, Elizabeth improved, and they're trying to improve somewhat on the Great Bible. Uh, but guess what? People still like their. Let me turn this thing off. They still like their Geneva Bible. That Geneva Bible is still. And you can still get the Geneva Bible online. You can read it. You can even read the notes. And that's often what troubles uh, the authorities in England are the notes that are in it and the things they say. We'll get that in a second. Well, Catholics aren't going to get left out of all this. And so, you know, you still got Catholics in England. You still got Catholics in Ireland. Um, they got to have their version. So remember now, they have doubled down on Latin. They said, now look. We think Latin is really good. You know, Latin is what we've trusted. It's what we've read for years. Uh, we think it's a good translation. If you're a learned person, you're going to read Latin. We can help. You know, they're not against English translations, but they like Latin as the preferred, official, signed-off version of the Bible. So they translate an English Bible from the Latin. And this is what we call the Reims Dewey or the Douay Reims and Again, it's got its niche, and um, but it becomes another English translation. But remember, it's coming off of the Latin, just like Wycliffe's Bible was. And eventually, we're going to end up with the King James Version. You got any questions about the timeline? All right. Here's what's going on in the throne of England. And I'm all Chris, yeah. How do, how do most of these men make a living and support their families? Are they all clergymen? A lot of them are. Coverdale is. Uh, John Rogers is. Um, now, the group that's over it, these would be um, Catholic scholars. The, the, the group in Geneva, I'm not sure about. Uh, they're, sort of a, they're sort of a group in exile. And uh, under... Let's see, what is that, 1557? Yeah, under Mary's reign, they are, they're outlaws because they're Protestants and Mary is Catholic. And so they head off to Geneva and they're probably teaching, they're supported, they're, um, I'm not really sure how they make their living, but some of them were scholars, some of them were clergy, some of them were both. Well, and if it was a group of people, there would be professionals and tradesmen. Yeah. And others could be, among. could be, and then they're, there may be, they're, they're, they can be supported by benefactors. You will have um, uh, wealthy patrons who support this, and they've, um, you know, maybe they, you know, just like the people that build the churches, they want to see this done, so they're going to support the, the works of these groups, and uh, they, they got an interest in this. Ultimately, it comes down to the king. You want the king's backing, or you know, that plane isn't going to fly. 
Um, so that's why, even though I have to dig through the, you know, kind of get through the weeds here, what's happening on the throne of England does influence the English translations. The Bible and the throne impact one another during this period. So here's, here's a little bit to simplify it. 1509 to 1547. Here's Henry VIII. You've seen the pictures of Henry VIII. He's usually a big large man, you know. Got a turkey leg in his hand. Um, Henry VIII needs a male heir, and his wives don't give him a male heir, so he needs to, but how is he going to do this? Because he's got, he's got his wife. You only get one wife, but he wants a new wife. So he annul the marriage and give me a new one so I can get a male heir. He doesn't know about chromosomes. And so, how, how are you going to do this? Well, he gets his lawyers on it. Then he finds out that there's this thing going on called the Reformation. And since the Pope won't do... Now, if the Pope had said, sure, Henry, that'd be it. Henry would have been fine. Because the Pope doesn't give him what he wants. He decides, you know what? If the Pope can grant me this in moment, because he's the head of the church, what if I, as the king were the head of the church in England. Because if they can have a different church over there, they can have a different church over here. It's a very simplified version of it. Leads to all sorts of chaos in England. But Henry does something unique. He makes himself the head of the church. That's the act of supremacy. Uh, no, the monarchs on Europe, in Europe aren't claiming to do that. They've got an arrangement with the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor where it's like, you stay in your lane, we'll stay in ours. Scotland's a different deal altogether, too. Um, Henry finally has a son named Edward VII. A lot of people are like, oh, Henry never got a son. No, he did get a son. Henry's uh, son is Edward VII, but Edward VII gets tuberculosis and dies at the age of 15. So he hasn't even had time to grow up and get married. It's Henry has no grandson is the problem. Now, Edward <laughs> is going to be your first king raised as a Protestant. Henry goes from being a Catholic subject of the Pope because the whole West is Catholic. Now, you don't have any other option. Henry suddenly creates another option. Here's Edward. Edward, and the king is always the defender of the faith. Now Edward is the first you know, original born king under this new Church of England. But the tradition doesn't continue with him. So he has to pass the torch to somebody. He passes the torch uh, to his Scottish cousin, Jane Grey. She's queen for nine days because she's not the best choice. There's a lot of politics and infighting and a lot of other problems going on. That's where Mary, who is Henry's oldest child from the first marriage, which Henry had annulled, which then means that Mary is illegitimate. She, you know, Henry, she can't even claim Henry as her father, and she certainly can't claim the throne. And if you see pictures of Mary and, and, you know, she looks angry. She always looks angry. And, and you know, she gets a bad rap. But she's, you know, she, she can become the, the head of, the, um, uh, of, the, of England. And she's married to the king in Spain, Philip, um, which troubles a lot of people in England, that you've got that foreign influence going on. And politics, politics, politics. But Mary is... Definitely Catholic. So she reverses a lot of the things that her father does. She says, okay, dad was wrong. Uh, he had my mom beheaded. I'm not happy with this. I'm the rightful ruler. She's got people who are supporting her. You support your monarch. You get, you know, you get your dues paid back to you. And one of those who's supporting her is the Pope. And the Pope, you know, she gives lands back to the Pope that Henry confiscated. Um, so here she is and, and by the way all those Protestants oh she's she's out to get them they're on the they're they're on the hit list now that's why a lot of them head off to to uh, Geneva I don't want to make Mary out to be the devil because I don't I don't think that's fair John Knox certainly did though he's a preacher in Scotland and um, we'll, we'll get to him in a second but he does he, and he's in Scotland. He's not even in England. But he's not fond of Mary. Maybe he thinks she's going to come after him. Mary dies in 1558. And her sister, Elizabeth, takes over. And Elizabeth I, now, she, 
she comes at this a different way, and she decides, okay, she sees all the problems that this causes, and she says, okay, we're not going to be Catholic, but we're not going to be Protestant either. We're going to be Anglican. We're going to be Church of England. And that third way that she develops sets a religious tradition there with the Church of England where it's like, wow, this is so different. It, it, they take this, this kind of vague middle stance on a lot of this, but that's how you keep England together in the 1500s. You've got to get the people united. Otherwise, they're at each other's throats. And we're going to tear the, the whole thing apart. Um, there, there's a lot of tension going on. Now, Elizabeth dies without an heir. And look, she has a pretty good reign there from 1558 to 1603. Um, she, uh, she deals with a lot of suffering in her personal life and her health. And uh, anyway, she has no heir. So the people who run things in the, in the court have to get together, the government, the parliament, they've got to find the next legitimate heir. And guess what? It's the king of Scotland. James VI, who they'll import down to England and say, hey, why don't you just wear both crowns? And he becomes James I of England. And he's our King James, for which we have the King James Bible. And he's an interesting uh, fellow, too, because he's a bit of a theologian. See, I, I think it's because you know, if you're, if you're the, the, the monarch of England, you've got all this tension going on. If you're the monarch in Scotland, it's not that it's not that tough, you know. The Church of Scotland, they're all Presbyterian. That's pretty much it. So James VI has a lot of time on his hands, and he's a bit of a theologian. In fact, he goes over to uh, he goes over to Copenhagen, he goes over to Denmark, and he finds out that they're hunting witches over there. He gets so fascinated by this, he's like, Ooh, you know, we can hunt witches, and he thinks he's doing God's work, and he thinks that witchcraft and all of that. Demonology, that that's a branch of theology. So he really gets into it. And that's where a lot of that stuff comes from. A lot of people blame the Puritans for that. No, you can trace it back to James I. He's fascinated by all this, and he really thinks that hunting down evil and doing something, that's that's the, the problem. You've got to do something about that, you know, because he's the king, and he's meant to defend the faith and defend the people. And if those demons are out there, then he's going to figure it out. He's got kind of this pseudo-scientific approach to it. Uh, he starts cataloging demons and what they like and what they don't like. And it's some fascinating stuff, and I'm off on a rabbit trail. Anyway, here's James. Church of Scotland is Protestant. It's, it's not having the problems that England is having. It's clearly Protestant. It, um, it's got its own church. Remember, the two crowns are not connected at this point. They're two different nations. They are Reformed. They are Presbyterian. So James VI comes into England with that background. He's been the monarch over a reformed Presbyterian, kind of a free-spirited, uh, common people church. Now he enters into a throne where he is clearly the head of the church. How do you do this? Because they're Anglican, they're Episcopalian, and he's a bit of a theologian. It's like everything is just set up perfectly for James. You've got guys in Scotland, back before James, when Mary was Queen of England, and she's Catholic. Uh, this is a little display of John Knox in Scotland. He's a scary dude. And um, he, he writes a book in 1558 <coughs> against Mary that's got one of the best titles in history, The First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women. <laughs> this guy's like the head of the He-Man Woman Haters Club. And, uh, but that, a lot of his sermons are, uh, you know, he's political. He's opposed to Mary, but this is all, you know, heavy stuff. And this is where a lot of that tension is coming from, you know, that still exists today, the, the sort of tension between Protestants and Catholics. I mean, it's not even about ideas or doctrines at this point. It becomes bitter. It becomes mean. And, you know, Knox is an intelligent man, but he sees all of this as very threatening. Um, and, in fact, the problems in England... Are, are so layered that you've got some of the Anglican leaders who accuse the Puritan leaders of being conscientious that are, they claim to have a conscientious spirit I'm sorry, I'm reading it wrong they have a contentious spirit under the name of conscience that means 
They're getting away with being contentious by saying, hey, it's just a matter of conscience. That's the 16th century version of saying, hey, I'm just keeping it real. Yeah. I'm just telling you, you know, in the name, in the name of Christian love, I'm just telling you, you know, they're, that's what they're doing. And it's like, oh, okay, so as long as you say with all due respect, you can say whatever ugly stuff you want. That's the nature of 16th century England. So if you feel like things are going that way today, don't worry. Human race has been here before. Well, it's always been that way. The Puritans then, and Knox is considered one of the first Puritans because he really wants to purify the church of all of that Roman papal influence. And he sees Mary as a threat. And she's on the doorstep. You know, It's like she's going to come up here against Scotland and bring all that stuff in here. So the Puritans, what they're trying to do is they're trying to purify the Church of England, or in his case, the Church of Scotland, from any influence. And a lot of it tends to be political in that world. Here's some of your English Puritans. Now, Knox is a Scotsman, but um, here your English Puritans. They like the name John. There's Thomas Matthew, who did the Matthew Bible. John Rogers. Here's John Fox, who does Fox's Book of Martyrs. These are some of the fellas who, when Mary becomes queen and she reverses Henry's reformation, they end up on her um, enemies list. And so no wonder John Fox writes a historical book of martyrs because they feel like martyrs themselves. Some of them head off to Geneva. Some of them are fighting the good fight. Some of them are working with pseudonyms. Uh, and then there's Miles Coverdale. Um, you know, and again, these look like these are all church leaders. So Jerry asked the question, "What do they do for their day job?" Well, they're church leaders in one form or another. Um, sometimes they find themselves in opposition. Some of them get martyred or they get persecuted. But you have different layers here. You start off. Some of them are English reformers with Henry. They see the way Henry's going, and they think, "Oh yeah, let's do this Reformation thing." And then England can break away from the continent. England always likes. Stuff different from the continent. They see themselves as special. And, uh, they, just, you know, they thought it was funny. Uh, the uh, Anglican bishops, then, these are the leaders in that Church of England. They see this as an opportunity to influence the local church and not have to answer to Rome. But then you have those who want to take the Reformation a bit further. And they're the Reformed Puritans, and they're being influenced by the Protestants. In Europe, they like the ideas, and they're saying, you know, maybe bishops aren't such a great idea. So some of these bishops go to the point of becoming reformed, and the ones who like being a bishop are like, no, 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 you're going too far. Finally, you get the pilgrims, who are another group of Puritans, who decide, you know what, we're just leaving, and we're going to go to the new world, and we're going to start all over again. That just gives you a simple sketch of how Puritans develop. I mean, the Reformation doesn't just happen like a flip switch. It's a progression. And people are at different points of the, um, the chain on this. Okay, any questions about Puritans? I'm not an expert on Puritans. Uh, okay, here then, let's go back to our English Bibles. Now you can see why this Geneva Bible is so popular. Because this is the Bible of choice of fellas like this. This is the Bible that speaks to their heart. And, and, and in 16th century terms, the Geneva Bible is really and truly the language. This is the way the, the, the people on the street talk, is, it, is the Geneva Bible. It's like the, the Bibles we have today, like the message or... The New Living Translations, hey, uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's our sort of level of common speech. Something like the King James in the 16th century might even be etched up just a bit, but not much, because that, that's one of the things that the King James does. But certainly the Great Bible is going to sound a little lofty, and the Bishop's Bible will too. Um, and even the way that they're printed, you know, if you got to see that book that I passed around, that copy of it, the typeface is bold and hard. It's black letter typeface. Did that get around? There's that little Bible. Yeah, just pass it around this way. And uh, yeah, Rick just sends it down that way. Um, it, 
it, it's meant to be substantial, whereas the Geneva Bible will be done in, a, in more of a, a Roman text, where it's, the letters are thin and light and very readable, um, which is a lot like the preface in the King James. So there is an artistic nature to these things. They, they have to match the furniture in your church. Um, and so you have Bible camps. See what I did there? You have Bible camps here, and, and they all like their particular Bible, their particular English Bible. So this is England, 16th century. You've got two main groups. You're going to sort people out religiously. Catholics, Protestants. Catholics, they know that people like the English Bible, so they develop the Rings Douay. Because here's the thing. Not everybody's running home with their own favorite copy of the Bible. You've got to have a Bible that's read in your worship and your service. So we're going to give you the one that's approved for the Catholics. It's this. If you're not going to use Latin, you're going to use this one for English. Maybe it's not for worship. Maybe it's a class. You're going to use this version. That's going to be the, the official one. Now, among Protestants, you have a few options. Because you've got the Anglicans. Remember, Elizabeth went with that middle way. We're not Catholic. We're not Protestant. We're Anglican. They still have a lot of the appearance of the traditions of the Catholic Church. They still have the vestments. They still have the, uh, the rituals. They still do this, the same symbols. Puritans will, there will be a, um, a kind of a, a spectrum here, but they're like, no, we, 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 we don't want any of that. And in the next hundred years, that will actually become big points of contention. They like the Geneva Bible, which is very uh, popular. And they like the Bishop's Bible, which is very Anglican, very high church. And that creates a bit of a problem because these are supposed to be one group. They're all supposed to be Church of England. And some of those who like this bishop's Bible are afraid that John Calvin and those Reformed people over on the continent are influencing our Church of England just a little too much. And one of the reasons they say that is because in the Geneva Bible, there are notes. You know, they got the little study notes in there. And they say things. Now remember, Anglicans, just so you know, Anglicans and these bishops, bishops like to have a king. Because they've got their archbishop, and then you've got your king. That's your church authority. They're all into authority. They're kind of the establishment types. Um, just to simplify it. These are, the, these are the rebels. These are the ones who, hey, you know, free spirit. You know, this is where your American founding fathers, they come out of, you know, look at how many of them are Presbyterians uh, in, uh, in the 1700s. But you got things like this. The note on Daniel 6 9 says, uh, that's, it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar. Herein is condemned the wickedness of the king who would be set up as a god and pass not what wicked laws he approved for the maintenance of the saints. Why did you talk about Nebuchadnezzar, right? I don't know. <laughs> if you're a paranoid king, you don't like statements like that showing up in the notes of the Bible. Daniel 6.22, for he did disobey the king's wicked commands, talking about Daniel, to obey God. And so did no injury to the king who ought to command nothing whereby God should be dishonored. We're telling the king, we're telling a king, any king, what he ought to and ought not to do. That's a bit bold. Of course, if you think that, hey, maybe the king does need to answer to God, you like the Geneva Bible. But if you're all for it, if you're a monarchist, it's like, oh, these people are a bit proud. You know, that's too much. Psalm 105.15, the psalmist says, Touch not my anointed, and do my prophets no harm. That's the psalm. That's how it translates verse 15. The note says that the anointed is a little note. Those who am I have sanctified to be my people. Hold on. That should be talking about the king. No, not according to Geneva Bible. See how popular it is? So this is why things like the Geneva Bible cause some problems. Now imagine how it is in the 1500s, and, you know, you're... You're going down to the pub house and you're talking to people down there in the town square and all that. You know, it's like, what Bible do you read? I read the Geneva Bible. You read that anti monarchist Geneva Bible? You know, how dare you? And it's like, well, how dare you think that the king, the king is no better than anybody else? People fight. People fight. They 
quarrel over this, and that's becoming a real problem. James starts to notice this, and some of his leaders start to notice this. Now, James is a peacemaker, but really he's wanting to keep the peace with his church leaders. Because James does like to be a theologian, and James likes for his people to be very spiritual. But James also likes to be the king, and he likes to have his bishops. So, who authorizes this new Bible that we can all agree on? It's another kind of a third way, it's sort of a compromise. The Hampton Court Conference is held in 1604, and a lot of these leaders, and some of them lean towards the Puritan scale, and some of them are more Anglican. And they come to James and they say, look, we've got some problems. Everybody's reading different Bibles. We need to settle on one Bible that everybody can accept. So, James, and there's other things that they have to do too. There's other little controversies like what kind of clothes they wear and what kind of symbols they use. Do they use rings in weddings because that's very Roman and the Puritans don't like that. They've got their whole list of grievances. In fact, one of the things that James will do in that conference is he'll tell them, look, we're going to stop excommunicating people over trifles and 12-penny problems. <laughs> he got this little phrase, which means piddling stuff. I mean, it'd be like if we had a king today, he'd say, hey, look, you know what? Why don't y'all just stop impeaching everybody every other day, okay? And then we get on with the business. That's what James does. He says, yeah, we've got to stop all this. So he gets a group together, and, there's, and he get, they've got rules. They set out some grand rules. And here's the one of the things. So people who hold up the King James Bible as the ultimate Protestant version, they translate the Apocrypha in the original one, those extra canonical books. It's in there. They don't get rid of those. So that stays, and because they have to go through a lot of revisions because sometimes the printer gets something wrong or, or something was off, and there's some real problems with that too. Uh, there's one of the early versions of this that has a typo in it, and when you get through the Ten Commandments, and instead of saying, thou shalt not commit adultery, somebody left the word not out. <laughs> it's called the Wicked Bible, those versions of it that are like that. It's a printer's error. And you see, it goes back to what that old scribe said. He said that losing one word can change the world. Um, anyway, they come up. What this means is they have to go through all those revisions. until It's not until 1769 that you finally have a standardized King James Version. So the King James Version is even fluid up to 1769. I'm not saying it changes drastically. There's just, again, all these little corrections and things have to be, you know, there's uh, that one that I'm passing around, one of the verses, uh, I can't remember what it is right now, but they preserved it in there. There's a line, I think it's uh, Exodus 14.10, and it's repeated three times. That's just a printer error. You know, and it doesn't change the meaning, but it's just not good. But remember, they're they're using this old, you know, big iron press with all of these huge typeset letters. They have to do all this by hand. It's an improvement over handwriting, but it's still very much a, a, a craftsman's work. Um, but this becomes the Bible dedicated to James that's appointed to be used in churches. Here's what we often don't know. We kind of end with James, but James certainly doesn't just sit down and do the work himself. He appoints people to run a project. This project is, is, is somewhat impressive. Um, you've got this archbishop, Richard Bancroft. He looks like the Yahtzee guy. But that's where you get your academic robes. He's a churchman. He's a clergyman. But notice how much it looks like academic robe. And they got this hat. Urban legend has it that that hat spreads out like that because when you were in the church and you had the high vaulted ceilings, well, pigeons live up there, and so that would keep the pigeons from messing up your robes. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. It seems like you're wasting your hat to save your coat. I don't get it. Man. An umbrella would seem to be a better choice, but maybe they didn't invent umbrellas in the 1500s. Anyway, so this archbishop is tasked by James. You take over the project. He's the overseer of the King James project. You have six translation teams, two teams. They, de they divvy up the, the books of the Bible. Now remember, since they're doing the Apocrypha, it's more than 66. 
They're translating 80 books, and they are working from the Hebrew and the Greek. They're actually working from the Greek um, version that Erasmus comes up with, with the edition, which is called the Textus Receptus, and the Septuagint, that, that Greek translation of the Jewish Bible. So they're working from the original languages, or close to the original languages. They actually do work in some, some Hebrew translations. And you've got two teams. Now notice, these are scholar towns. Oxford, Cambridge, Westminster. And church and academy are sort of blended in these days. Um, a lot of the, the positions are the same. Um, anyway, these, these two teams divvy up the, the, the books that they're going to translate. You've got 47 scholars that are working. They're all Church of England. There's, there's one man on the team who's not also a clergyman. Um, he, he's a he's a languages uh, guy. I can't think of his name right now. It wouldn't really matter anyway. But once they get their work done, they send it off to the king's official printer, a fellow named Robert Barker, and he got his name in the King James preface. If you bought an original King James Bible, then when it first gets published, it's going to cost you the price of ten shillings, unless you want it found, and then that'll be an extra two shillings. It takes 12 pence to make a shilling, no, yeah, and it takes 20 shillings to make a pound. And um, if you look at what people earned in those days and what you know wages were for, for your common workers, you're looking at one of these loose leaf bindings maybe around $200 in our money today. That's nothing to sneeze at. And you'll see different estimates. Some people will say it'll be as high as 4,000. I don't know. It's hard to translate money across 400 years. Um, and you've got, but again, this isn't, 10 shillings is not, I mean, people have farthings. They, they, they have farthings in these days, which is a fourth of a penny. And a penny is a, like a, there's, it takes 240 of them to make a whole pound. It's not just one to 100. It's not decimal. So, uh, you, you know, they they with little amounts of money. So 10 shillings is going to be a lot. So obviously churches are buying these, groups are buying these, and they're meant to be read in the academy. And and but what an exciting time it is. And what they've got now is they've got a version of English that now is appointed to be read. The Geneva Bible continues to be popular among certain groups, but the Bishop's Bible and the Great Bible and all those others no longer need them. This is where the King James picks up and starts to gain prominence. It's picking up momentum now. And as you'll see, as we'll see next week, it will hold that position for about 250 years. It will be the standard English translation. And especially when we when we migrate over to America. Now they take that Geneva Bible early on, and there's some groups that really get into that. But then the King James is, is easier to print. It's more accessible. The English um, is just as good as the Geneva Bible. And so it gets distributed as well. And it gets picked up by different groups. And then it gets familiar. It just takes on this traditional familiar air so that people know it. And they learn their language from it. And a lot of the phrases that we say today are from this group of translators who are working on that, and they don't know it, but they're coining phrases that will exist even today, like apple of my eye. They're, they're just, they don't say that. They're working with this. It's like, how do you translate? Oh, well, you know, translate it like this. And they're having to invent this. And then, you know, we... Um, uh, I've lost my whole list that I have mentally of all these different phrases. Handwriting on the wall. Handwriting on the wall. Yeah, you know, they're coming up with that. Jumping Jehoshaphat. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's there's others that they have to make translation guesses. It's like, well, because it's a Hebrew idiom originally, and they're transliterating that into English. I'll tell you a story about how that works in translation. Some of you know Oscar Nolasco. He's our uh, a preacher over at Iglesia de Cristo. 
I speak a little Spanish, he speaks really good English. We're sitting there talking, and I'm practicing my Spanish, and I'm like, hey, you know, Oscar, I guess when you became a citizen, you had to get through a lot of red tape. And he's like, what? I said, you know, red tape. Cinta Roja. And he's like, I don't get it. He knows the words that I'm saying in English and Spanish, but the meaning of it is lost on him. And then I thought, you know what? That is, that's an idiom. It, it goes back. It has a context that you're like, what is it? It's like, you know, finer than frog's hair or something like that. They have to come up with these things, and then they enter into the English language, and then people understand what it means and what it's all about. All right, I'll wrap up with one thing, because, you know, one of the things, the mystique of the King James Version that we still deal with today is, we've all met somebody who says, look, the King James Bible is the only correct Bible. All right, so for those who believe that, for those who are staunchly, you know, and, and that's okay if you believe that. But I'm just going to tell you right now, and since this is going out on the interweb, I'm about to be labeled a heretic. Okay, here we go. Because <laughs> I, can't, I can't do anything about it. I'm trying to understand. Uh, there's a Baptist scholar that, that broke down five different levels of this, of, of how that King James only ideology developed and what it, how it might be reflected. One is, this is the one that is really respect, preference and tradition. It's the Bible I grew up with. It's the Bible we've always used. It's the Bible that makes sense. We like the music. It's good. Use it. And they understand it. Fine. It's, it's what you memorize. Yeah, it's what you memorize, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's still verses in my head that are memorized in King James. Uh, you know, lots of yees and thous, and that's okay. If you know what you're talking about, now you, you have to understand it. Sometimes you use that, and others may not understand what you're saying especially if you're in different language contexts, maybe where English is a second language. They haven't learned ye and thou the way maybe we have. They're not as familiar with it. So, anyway, but that's, that's one option. It's like King James only. They're really saying King James, I like it. Then you've got a group, and these are general categories. The Hebrew and Greek base for the King James was the most accurate. Now, with that mindset, you could take that same group of, of Greek texts that they translated from, those original uh, these guys, you could take their same working documents and you could update the English and do all that work, but you would have to use the same original text that they did because the idea, the notion is that the Greek texts that they used are actually more accurate. Now, that's debatable. Okay? And we've looked at earlier stuff and we don't have time to get into all that right now, but theoretically, you could improve on the King James. You got a third group, that, that that group of documents is mainly called the Texas Receptus. They're gonna go a little further and they're gonna say, you know what? That work on the Texas Receptus, the Greek edition that Erasmus did, God had a hand in that. God thought that that's a really good, he providentially preserved that Greek text. And there's, there's a long historical reason why that idea is and it goes back to some of this stuff with Protestants and Anglicans okay? but if you believe that you believe that and I've been as I told some people today I've been trying to understand well now wait please just explain why you believe that and I haven't gotten an answer yet so maybe somebody online will tell me one day I'm going to go a step further this is number four the Greek the King James Bird translation the translation is divinely inspired not just the writings, not the writings of, you know, the New Testament, but the translation itself is inspired. Now, that's a bit of a bold move. We know that we've got divinely inspired writings in the scriptures. We believe that. But we don't know of any translations that are divinely inspired. Remember back when that Greek is being translated into Coptic and Latin and Syriac and all those other languages, Ethiopic. There's no interest in those being divinely inspired translations. The idea is just get the word out into these different languages, you know, proclaim it in every tongue. But then to go to this move and say, okay, so then, and I think what you, this group, they're saying that the King James English is the equivalent of the Hebrew and Greek. 
That means then, okay, so what's, if that's the case, then what is your divinely inspired Spanish translation? What is your divinely inspired Russian translation? What is your, and if you say, well, those aren't inspired, well, then that means that everybody has to learn English <laughs> to understand the real word of God. And that's sort of like the Quran, you know, until you hear it in Arabic, it's, it's not quite that like, yeah. You really, there's still a fifth step. And I've, this is the one that I'm, and this is the one that kind of still hangs on and exists. It not only says that they're equivalent, it says that the King James English translation is better than the Greek and the Hebrew. That's saying that the, the translation of the King James into English is an additional revelation beyond just the Greek and Hebrew. That means that you've got God reveals the word, Old Testament, New Testament, but it's not until the 17th century that God then enables additional revelation to make the King James Version the perfect translation. Now that gets people riled up if you question that. Some people. The people who buy into that. And I'm looking for reasons why that's the case. How It's like, okay, I want to believe that. Tell me how I can believe that. And I can't find it other than it's just because we said so. Now, the other problem with that is, is because I've dared to challenge that, that means I'm a heretic and I'm false. So, yeah, it's like, well, see, just because you question it, then you're really dangerous. Okay, well, wait a second. Correct me. Show me where. But you can't. And I'm. Anyway, we can get into this next week, too, and I'm already in a load of trouble then. So, um, but I just, I can't go this far. I, I think that that's, you're, you're, you're asking too much there. Uh, especially now that you know the history of how the word of God is shared. If God, God wants his word to be revealed, he wants everybody in every tongue to praise him and worship him. So how can you preference one particular translation? I'm not saying it's not good. It's actually very good. And I, I have a lot of respect for this group right here. And when you see the work that they did, there's a lot to commend it. Now, I think the Geneva Bible is just as good. Of course, there's problems with the notes. <laughs> but that's a different matter. And I think the work that a lot of the other translators did is, is great too. But anyway, we'll get into that next week because we'll jump ahead to 1881 when the Revised Standard Version comes out. And that's another thing. That gets a lot of people pretty upset. I think that's where a lot of this starts to come from because it's viewed as the translation of all them liberal, woke people of the 19th century. So. All right. Well, thanks for your time. Thanks for your attention. And uh, pray for me. Bye-bye. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.